And now let's hear from John Kernodle about, um, well, I would him tell you. A reading from the Petavatu. The Petavatu is a collection of 51 scriptural poems that detail conversations between the Buddha and his followers about how the effects of our actions can lead to rebirth in the realm of pretas or hungry ghosts. Many of the poems are testaments from the ghosts about their own fates, morality stories designed to press those who engage with them into better behavior. But some go a step further and detail how our engagement with these hungry ghosts can benefit both the ghosts and ourselves. This reading, Shades Outside the Walls, is such a text. Outside the walls they stand and at crossroads. At doorposts they stand, returning to their old homes. But when a meal with plentiful food and drink is served, no one remembers them. Such is the karma of living beings. Thus, those who feel sympathy for their departed relatives and friends give timely donations of proper food and drink, exquisite, clean, thinking, may this be for our relatives, may our relatives be happy. And those who have gathered there, the assembled shades of the relatives, friends, and companions with appreciation give their blessing for the plentiful food and drink. May our loved ones live long because of whom we have gained this gift. We have been honored and the donors are not without reward. For there in their realm, there's no farming, no herding of cattle, no commerce, no trading with money. They live on what is given here, hungry shades whose time here is done. As water raining on a hill flows down the valley, even so does what is given here benefit the departed. As rivers full of water fill the ocean full, even so does what is given here benefit the dead. She gave to me, he acted on my behalf. They were my relatives, companions, friends. Offerings should be given for the dead when one reflects thus on things done in the past. For no weeping, no sorrowing, no other lamentation benefits the dead whose relatives persist in that way. But when this offering is given, well placed in the spiritual community. It works for their long-term benefit and they profit immediately. In this way, the proper duty to relatives has been shown. Great honor has been done to the dead and monks have been given strength. The merit you've acquired isn't small. I'm now going to sing a brief invocation from my Zen tradition called the Gate of Sweet Nectar. And it's an invitation to the hungry ghosts to join us today. Calling out to hungry hearts everywhere through endless time. You who wander, you who thirst, I offer you this body mind, calling out to hungry spirits everywhere through endless time, calling out to hungry hearts, all the lost and the left behind, gather round and share this meal, your joy and your sorrow I make them mine, calling out to hungry hearts everywhere through endless time. You who hung, wander, you who thirst, I offer you this body mind, 
calling out to hungry spirits everywhere through endless time, calling out to hungry hearts, all the lost and the left behind. Gather round and share this meal, your joy and your sorrow, I make it mine. Budam saranam gachami, damam saranam gachami, sangham saranam gachami, to the Buddha, to the teachings, and to the spiritual community, I turn to refuge. What are you hungry for? What do you crave? During this time of pandemic, even if we are able to be with others distanced across backyards or connected via video chats and Zoom, we might be hungry for touch. We might have the hunger of envy, falling for the trap while scrolling through Instagram of believing that others have it so much better than we do. We might be hungry for achievement, for the next big gig, the next promotion. We could find ourselves confronted with the hunger of addiction, that consuming dependency to chase an ever more elusive fix. There's hunger that comes from grief or any other extreme mental state we're hungry for just a few more minutes, seconds even, with those we've lost. We're starving to regain our mental equilibrium. And in a country where millions of people, many of them children, lack food security, we might simply be hungry for the next meal. Welcome to life in what Buddhist cosmology calls the desire realms. According to this cosmology, we live in one of six desire realms. This may sound a bit paradoxical for those who think of Buddhism as a primarily atheistic religion, but these six realms contain gods, demigods, humans, animals, hungry ghosts, and even the hell realms. And due to our hungers, our fears, and our ignorance to the true nature of the universe and ourselves, we spend eons being born and dying and being reborn, moving throughout these various realms. This is the cycle of rebirth called in Sanskrit samsara. Even the gods, whose lives are unfathomably long, eventually grow old and die, often confused, having spent their entire lives in bliss. Now, I am ill-equipped to tell anyone how literally to take any cosmology, even uh, that of my own religion. And even within Buddhism, there are a wide variety of approaches to the obviously non-scientific way the Buddha and early Buddhists explained the universe. Some Buddhists look at it as a teaching tool, a way to help understand what we're going through here and now. Some among the secular Buddhist movement here in the West have gone so far as to call for this cosmology, as well as most of the teachings on rebirth to be jettisoned completely, seeing no room for myth in their practice of the Dharma. And then there are Buddhists, perhaps most, for whom samsara is real in some way, shape, or form. We Buddhists aren't that different from any other world religion in our diverse interpretations of our faith's teachings. But regardless of how literally one takes Buddhist cosmology, there is a power to it. To think of rebirth does force one to think about how one is living now. And of course, for Buddhism, the goal is emphatically not rebirth in the realm of the pleasure-loving gods, but to escape from samsara entirely. Samsara, the world we inhabit, is how it's supposed to be flawed, painful, scary, yet we can liberate ourselves from it. More importantly, from the position of my tradition of Zen Buddhism, as well as many other traditions ori originating in East Asia, Vietnam, and Tibet, we can help liberate others from this suffering world as well. 
So where do the hungry ghosts or pratas in Sanskrit fit into all of this? To be reborn in the hungry ghost realm, one must have attachments, cravings, hungers to which one is inextricably bound. These cravings can be many and varied and are not all so obvious as attachments to what a traditional Buddhist might call immoral behavior. In our reading today, the hungry ghosts were merely loved ones still too attached to the world that they had left. Regardless of the attachment, the traditional depiction of the hungry ghost realm is bleak. The ghosts themselves are depicted in various ways, but one of the most prominent is the image of an emaciated figure with a distended belly, painfully narrow and pinched neck, and a large gaping mouth. They tirelessly try to feed, but the food they touch turns to ash or hot metal and cannot be swallowed. When they bend to drink from a stream, it is said to boil or turn to a toxic sludge. Keeping with this traditional view for just a moment, the feeding of hungry ghosts is said to be one of the utmost responsibilities for the Buddhist community. Early texts suggest that only a Buddhist monk is capable of recognizing and feeding a hungry ghost. As Buddhism spread to East Asia, China, Korea, and Japan, the teachings on hungry ghosts mingled with folk traditions, and there are festivals to this day dedicated to feeding and placating these poor otherworldly beings. The invocation I sang comes from a service within Zen Buddhism dedicated entirely to feeding the hungry ghosts. And yes, in these festivals and formal services, offerings of food are usually made, but we also offer them bodhi, the knowledge that they can be free from their hunger, the wisdom to see the harm their hungers have caused, the potential to awaken beyond their hunger. We Buddhists are called to feed them all. For me, it's not enough to stop there. I do find the traditional imagery and sacred writing and ritual relating to hungry ghosts to be powerful. It does help me think about my own behavior, my attachments, the relationships and activities, foods and experiences I crave in ways that come back to bite or worse, bite others. And even though I am a Western Buddhist and steeped in traditions of rationalism and materialism, my imagination is nevertheless strong enough that the traditional cosmology is something I truly feel and which plays a role in my life. But then there's the vow I make every morning upon waking, every time I sit down to meditate and often before drifting off to sleep. It's the first bodhisattva vow. Beings are numberless. I vow to liberate them. In his 1961 essay, Buddhist Anarchism, Poet and Zen practitioner Gary Snyder referenced the Pratas, the hungry ghosts, by turning the mirror of their creation back on what he viewed as a deeply deluded sick society. Our modern society, he noted, that it creates populations of Prata. The soil, the forests, and all animal life are being consumed by these cancerous collectivities. The air and water of the planet is being fouled by them. Snyder could, in my estimation, add to this environmental critique the pretas produced by racial injustice, religious bigotry, consumerism, and so much more. There are the pretas we pass by on the street every day, created by our society's failure to provide housing for all. There are the pretas, the hungry ghosts enslaved by the opioid epidemic, created in part by one of the wealthiest families on the planet. Most recently this week, we saw a riotous, insurrectionary mob of pretas hungry to the point of violence for an oppressive idea of some never existed America. And yes, as much as I will forever strive and struggle against rising fascism anywhere, my vow calls for me to liberate them too. 
How then do we do the work of liberation, of feeding the hungry ghosts that exist right now all around us, maybe even within us? We can make a meal, not of food, but of wisdom, compassion, equanimity, and all the other liberatory virtues. In my Zen lineage, a master once said that even if you only have a single grain of rice, you have everything you need to make a meal capable of feeding the universe entire. That single grain of rice is us, our little lives drifting through samsara. But lest I sound too self-sacrificial, I do not mean to suggest we let the hungry ghosts feed on us. I don't mean to suggest that in our work we neglect our own needs or healthy boundaries. Anyone who has lived or worked, for example, with someone in the throes of addiction knows that you can't just indulge someone to sobriety. Indeed, Compassion is not simply love and rainbows, but can be and must be fierce and determined when the need arises. There is a reason, after all, why so many Buddhist guardian figures are depicted with monstrous, wrathful visages. For me, the ritual of inviting the hungry ghosts to share in a meal is a way to spiritually recommit myself to the liberatory work I want to see in the world. Sometimes the work looks like a confrontation with fascism and racism. Sometimes that work can be the kind of mutual aid that actually provides meals to marginalized and forgotten people. And it is a reminder that I have been a hungry ghost too, one way or another. But just as others can be liberated and models of a better way of living together in samsara created, so too can I or anyone else awaken beyond our cravings, our attachments. This is one of the beautiful possibilities handed down over millennia from the Buddha and from the spiritual community that has kept the Buddha's teachings alive. Om. Amen.